I'm here as ever with Dr. Richard Scott, GP. Hello, Richard. Andy, really good to be back. Um, just for those of you who aren't quite sure who Richard is, you are a GP, which outside of the UK might be more well known as a family practitioner. So you're the first port of call when you've got a funny lump on your leg and you don't know what it is. Yeah, you're, you're right. First port of call <laughs> for everything from, yeah, from physical stuff. What's this mole? What's this lump? To mental stuff. You know, why am I feeling so terrible? And quite often and increasingly these days to spiritual stuff. You know, yeah. I don't know what to do with my life. It's just a mess. So, yeah, that's the people come to us with a whole range of things these days where sometimes they used to go to vicars, ministers in the past, and now they seem to come to doctors. Fine. Uh, I remember I went once I had this funny little I don't know what the medical term is. It's like a it's like where uh, it's like where the blood blister stops at the skin, which isn't mm -hmm. that exciting at one level. I went to see my doctor said, what is this lump? I'm a bit concerned. He says, well, I'm glad you came to see me, but I've never seen one here. This is fascinating. And he called his colleagues in. Oh, you don't mind. Do you have never seen one there before. And it was right in the corner of my groin that night. We had a church um, family group thing we went to and two of the people there were, were doctors. One was a GP and the other one's a GP specialising in um, hospital, kind of uh, uh, the diseases that you can't get out of hospitals, um, sort of virusy stuff. Anyway, his wife said, oh, I want to see this. This sounds fascinating. And I had to say to her, I really don't think our relationship would be good if you saw this. And she went on and on. And her husband had to say, darling, I, I really think this is one of those you need to stop digging because apparently it was fascinating. Yeah. Oh, well, it's, it's always good to be what we used to call fascinomas. Um, it was good, to, the source of a fascinoma. <laughs> I was that night. Everybody else wanted to know what it was as well. No, nope, not going there. That's not what I'm going to share with you. Right. Everybody gets five minutes of fame. <laughs> I do. Yeah, it was that. So I was there on the, on this bed in in the doctor surgery. And yeah. Oh, come and have a look. Oh, that's fascinating. Well, that's interesting. Thanks. My misery is your joy. Great stuff. Right. Um, let's move on to some questions. So we, I, I've got a load of questions here before me. We'll work through these one at a time. If you can answer these, fantastic. If not, we can always circle back in a future date. Uh, I won't put a clock on because that would stress me out, let alone you. <laughs> right, let's just dive straight in. Um, dementia and aphasia, are they in any way connected medically? Well, aphasia is the, is the inability to speak. And what we tend to see is that is a classic symptom of certain strokes that, that people can have. There are other causes of, of aphasia. Uh, the problem with dementia is it's more of a it's more of a global decline, so it can affect all parts of, of, of your of your mind and your thinking. Um, but yeah, for some people, it, it will affect speech. Not not so commonly aphasia, to totally the ability to speak, but dysphasia, speaking poorly um, and making no sense. Um, so yeah, they can be linked, but they're certainly not the same thing. And there, there are many causes of aphasia. Um, and and yeah, a sudden loss of uh, that points to a stroke by and large. Fine. Uh, just outline really briefly, what's a stroke for those of us who may be a little bit less than certain? Sure, sure. So a stroke is when you have a, um, uh, uh, the, the circulation in the brain is affected. It's, it's three quarters of strokes are due to a blockage of an arterial flow. So sudden blockage to the, to the blood vessels from a clot or an embolus um, will stop the blood flow to the brain and that part of the brain will die. And that's why we have this fast thing that's all over the buses and all over the news. You know, if you see someone with with, with facial weakness or it's affected their speech um, and you know you've got a short time to do something about it um, because these these three quarters can be reversed by um, blood thinning medicines thrombolysis so the three quarters are due to um, a blockage of the blood flow one quarter is due to a bleed um, and that's why scans are very important which is it the two uh, because the treatment for a bleed is obviously not to give thrombolysis otherwise you make the bleed worse yes um, and some bleeds need evacuating. Um, so, uh, yeah, the, I mean, there's been great, great progress with this thrombolysis, you know, dealing with blood clots. Fantastic progress. In fact, a good friend of mine, um, he had a stroke and his wife was there and she's a GP and she spotted it, rushed into A&E. And she said, as the needle went in to give him his thrombolysis, the, the droopy face, the loss of speech recovered in front of her eyes. Wow. You know, it's that good. And that's why people need to respond quickly. Wow, there's a, a reminder if ever there was one to uh, seek medical professional help quickly. Sometimes it matters. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, very much. OK, next one. Uh, red wine. I heard once upon a time that it can be good for the heart, including recovery from heart surgery. Is this true or not? Uh, this this is a tough one. 
not least for those of us who like red wine, um, uh -huh. which I'm a member. Um, yes, uh, uh, when we were at, uh, uh, soon after uh, medical school, so 40 years ago, suddenly red wine was a good guy. A small amount of red wine uh, increases your lifespan, reduces cardiac events, heart problems, um, meant to be a good thing, uh, with, a, with a bit of a, a U-shaped curve. So so if you think of a U at the top of the U, no red wine, well, your, your mortality is this. As you have a little bit of red wine, it drops. If you have too much, it goes up the other side. So there's a sort of optimum amount of red wine. I might say in the press recently, suddenly red wine's become less of a good guy and even a bad guy. Uh, and I have to say, I'm, I'm actually a tad confused to know whether it's good or bad these days. I suspect there's not much in it. Uh, all I would say as a Christian is undoubtedly Jesus drove, uh, drank red wine. Um, you know, he, he, when he when he turned water into wine at Cana, his first miracle. You know, he wouldn't have done that if he hadn't he hadn't approved of wine. Now I'm sure he's helping out some friends at the same time. But but I, I think uh, wine is okay in moderate moderation. And uh, at the moment, the science seems to be a bit split, really. Confused science, fine. Okay, uh, let's move on to this one from anonymous. When I take a paracetamol, I always get quite constipated. Is there anything I can do to reduce or remove the problem? Or take something with it that might help? Or is there another painkiller that I could take that's similar to paracetamol that's less likely to cause the problem? Yes, that's a, that, that's, that's, a, that's a shame, really, because it's such a mild painkiller with so little side effects. Um, I mean, the first thing is the great, re the great majority of people who get constipated in the West is because we don't drink enough. It's not the fault of a drug. A drug might sort of bring it to light. But we, as we always say, we should poo like cows and not like rabbits. <laughs> if you poo like a rabbit, by and large, you're not having enough fluid, fruit or fibre to bulk it up. You know, cows poo as they do because they get plenty of fibre in their grass and plenty of water in the grass. Um, rabbits, um, <laughs> obviously less so. So, um, so the first thing to do is to drink, drink more and then make sure your diet is good. So lots of fruit uh, and lots of veg. And that tends to bulk and also bran and wholemeal bread. So look at the diet. However, if you've done that and you're still having constipation from, from paracetamol, then yes, there's plenty of things to do, like taking a, a mild laxative like lactulose or senna, movicol. There's a range of, 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 of laxatives. Um, I wouldn't go up the, get up, up the range for pain relief because when you're going, going up the range, you're usually talking about codeine containing drugs, which will definitely make you constipated in that case. So really, I'd, I would say stick to the paracetamol if it's doing a job for the pain relief and take a little bit of something on the side if your diet doesn't solve the problem. Okay, look. Right, let's move on to this one. Um, feed a cold, starve a fever. Is it rooted in anything medical? <laughs> yes, these old these old wives' tales. Uh, that's, a, that's a very good... I mean, the thing is, most people, when they have a fever, don't actually fancy eating. Um, so, um, actually, in a sense, one isn't going to feed a fever because you, you're just off your food. Certainly what matters with fevers is drinking because uh, you can rapidly get dehydrated. So the, the, the fluids matter. So in a sense, you're starved from the feed because actually you probably don't fancy the food anyway. Feeding a cold, is there anything in it? Well, I mean, the cold's going to get better anyway, given a couple of weeks. Um, and if you've got an appetite, certainly feed it. I mean, why not? Whether it makes any difference to the cold, mm, not convinced. Fine. It's interesting, some of these old wives' tales, so-called, I guess there must be some some root somewhere of truth but it's it's picking the truth out from the myth isn't it? it it is and science will sometimes say oh actually you know the hundreds of years ago you got it right but but often mm, no you didn't <laughs> fine just one on the cold uh cold with a cough now i we've had this i've met loads of people they've all said the same thing we have a cold we have a cough when we were younger the cough would come and go now it feels like the cold and the cough are just there for months and months and months so my question my question would be is that different colds, different coughs one after the other, or is that just how colds and coughs works today? Yeah. Well, I mean, viruses, are classic upper respiratory infection, viral infection, will give you a cold to start with, sometimes with a, snore, uh, with a sore throat, uh, maybe a sore ear, and then move down and, and give you a cough. So usually that you, if you have a cold, you've got to have a, a cough to an extent. Now, there are some viruses, and not least COVID, where they can make you, the, the cough last and persist and it makes you sort of hypersensitive your your um uh, your tubes your big tubes and you'll just keep on coughing and then of course there's a whole group of patients and i've seen these this week where what happens when with with, with certain viruses you get a slight narrowing of the of the of the tubes um in an asthma like reaction if you like and if that's the case you'll get you get three things you'll get a, a, a wheeze you'll get shortness of breath and a prolonged cough 
And the treatment for that is that open up the tubes, which is when we use inhalers or sometimes oral steroids. So certainly the two go together. And if you have a prolonged cough, yeah, go and see a doc, because if you've got an element of tightness of the tubes, we can solve that very quickly. Um, you know, we can really help you. Okie doke. Right, we're going through some different subjects tonight. Um, is urine, the colour of water, the healthiest colour to have? Well, if you've got it the colour of water, that means you're drinking well. So, uh, yes, actually, that, that's, that's almost certainly true, such that people with dark urines, it's often an indication of disease. They're not very well. They're not drinking enough. They're more likely to have urine infections. Uh, sometimes it can be symptomatic with other diseases. So, by and large, if you're having very, very dilute urine, yes, it's a good thing, except there are some conditions which, where, where people make too much urine, uh, diabetes, uh, mellitus, diabetes, insipidus being two cases. Um, and so if, if you're thinking, gosh, I'm not drinking that much, but I've got all this urine, pale urine going out and I'm peeing several times a night and I'm going all the time during the day, then you need to see a doctor because there are, you know, sometimes excess is, is, is not a good thing. But if you're peeing normally and your urine is nice and clear and you're drinking well, then, then you're onto a winner by and large. Righty ho. Uh, sticking with water, but not urine. Right. So this comes, someone set a story in because they saw an actor, Mark Wahlberg, who has embraced cold plunges for a healthier lifestyle. So cold plunges, health. What's the what's the real truth on all this? Because there's so much information around, isn't there? Need to do this as a topic because this is this is you know, we like hot topics on this show. We do. And this is a well, it's been going for a few years. I can't think of the country that Danish, I think, is as a guy who's the sort of the the, you know, the, the mentor or, or for all these 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 cold dips. Um, but actually, I think that's a really good subject um, because if I'm going to look into the physiology, what it does to your body, why it's meant to be good for you, um, how cold is cold, and all the rest of it. So I think that's a bit too much to answer in one go. And, and I think this, whoever that, that listener is, thank you very much. You've given us an idea for another program. Indeed. Yeah, we see that everywhere. Yeah, take a whole, take a cold plunge. Don't take a cold plunge. Uh, this long, not too long. Uh, we kind of understand that if it's too cold for too long, we're going to end up with hypothermia. So there is going to be mm. some, you've got to be sensible. But yeah, we'll find out. That's good. Another topic. Well, and we know that athletes, and that, you know, when they finish running around, suddenly they have plunged into an ice bath. I mean, I'm glad to say that, that I never got to that level of athletics because it sounds horrible. Um, but it does seem to be good for them in terms of reducing injuries. So that, there's going to be something in it. But yeah, let's let's look at that uh, in, in one fell swoop. Excellent. I do actually remember the river dance. Uh, not me personally. I didn't do it. But I remember seeing the the, the dancers in the river dance would come off stage and then get into um, uh into a nice bath because it was probably good for the muscles or something. But yeah, we can look at that more more detailed. Um, I think this is someone who's in disbelief at something you said. Does a caffeinated cup of tea really help before you have some exercise to help you lose weight? Well, it seems to be that it, the, this, the study was done on coffee, um, to be fair. So I can't comment on tea. I mean, one would imagine it's, you know, it might have the same effect, but we can't say it does because the studies haven't been done. Hmm. Um, so I can't, no, I, I can't say the caffeinated tea will do so because we haven't proven it or, or it hasn't been proven. But all, all, the, all the study shows is that the, uh, a strong coffee um an hour before exercise helps you helps you lose some weight so now we, we can't just say that's fine with tea it'll have the same effect you've got to prove it fine uh, and then one last one we've got here um please can you ask dr richard scott why is it so difficult to find a cure for the common cold yes well if there was one single virus causing the common cold they'd have nailed it years ago because lots of there's been cures for lots of other viruses over the you know, over, over the course of time, including COVID recently. Um, but the thing about viruses, they're cunning little beasts and they keep changing their nature. So we might call it common, but actually the virus that you get to, you know, tomorrow may well be different from one in three weeks time. It's always changing its nature because they are, somehow the virus uh, is aware, of course it's not a, a brain thing, but it knows that there is a battle going on here between the host, us, and the, and the parasite, if you like, the virus. And, and they ch they keep changing their nature so that the host can't just completely be immune to them because it's in the virus's interest to get in our cells and replicate more of itself. Mm. So, uh, you know, the co we may call it the common cold, but the viruses are constantly changing. Uh, and that's why it's, it's, it's a real challenge. Plus, I might say, I think you know, what the researchers do is they, they target the really dangerous ones, the COVIDs, other ones, you know, the, the, the nasty ones, particularly uh, in Africa, like you know, Rift Valley virus and, and, and others, 
uh, Zika virus, some of the, you know, these are the ones they need to target because these these kill large numbers of, numbers of people. And so I think they're concentrated on those things because also they don't seem to change as much. The common cold is a little bigger. <laughs> Interesting. Okay. And then one that comes to my mind off the back of that is some people will say, oh, antibiotics, that'll fix everything. If I have a cold, I go to the doctor and I've heard them say, I'm going to go to the mold, my, my doctor, I'm going to demand antibiotics. And I'm sitting there thinking, I don't think you're going to get antibiotics for the common cold. Um, what, what's your GP's answer to that? Well, yeah, you're absolutely right. And this is something we see, even though people aren't always as expressive as that, that's that's the subtext. I mean, when they come in, I want an antibiotic. And antibiotics kill bacteria and they don't kill viruses. Now, it's undoubtedly true that some people with a, a viral infection will have their body weakened and then suddenly in comes the bacteria and, and, and causes more havoc. And then we treat the bacteria and that gets rid of that. And then the virus goes away over a couple of, or two or three weeks or so. Um, but to come along with this sort of fairly sort of normal standard minor cold in your nose, sore throat and a, a, a minimal cough. No, you're not going to get antibiotics in your GP because it's not appropriate because it's a virus. The antibiotics won't work. Um, and then when people say, oh, well, I had antibiotics and it got better soon. Well, it would have got better soon anyway, because <laughs> the antibiotics cannot kill viruses. It's, you know, it's not logical. Um, only when there's bacteria moving over the top. And that's where, if you like, the skill for us comes in when we see someone. Are they simply viral or are they a bit worse than that? Um, so yeah, that's that's when we make a judgment call about whether, whether to give them. And of course, antibiotics, you know, getting it right matters because there's so much resistance to antibiotics now. And that's because to an extent we've over prescribed them over the years and, and the public have over demanded them. And, you know, we, we actually need to be tough sometimes and say, no, this isn't right. You don't need one and you're not getting one. <laughs> then, of course, if people you know, they think, well, I'm, I'm going to go and seek a second opinion and then third opinion and then turn up in A&E, sooner or later, they'll get antibiotics from somebody. Uh, and that's a shame because actually that's not helpful for you know public health knowledge and, and awareness. Um, one that threw me, which I've just remembered thinking about all this, is I had uh, a lung infection. And when I asked the doctor at the time in the hospital, I said, oh, is this like pneumonia or something? He says, we don't really talk about it like that because we just call it a lung infection. So what a lung infection, is that bacterial or is that viral or can there be either? Sure. No, well, there's, there's, there's causes of lung infections from viruses to bacteria to fungi. It's a whole range of, of causes. I think we probably don't use the name of pneumonia so much because it alarms people. You know, the days uh, well, when I was a kid, you were a kid, and, and, and certainly before antibiotics, you know, if you've got pneumonia, you, you're a goner. You know, proper bacterial infection without antibiotics is going to spread and kill you. So uh, although it's a, a truth, we, we, we probably don't use the word as much as we used to because it's, it's alarming. So we call it a chest infection or a lung infection. And uh, uh, but, you know, from time to time, we'll, we'll see a really bad one in, in, in general practice. And I'll say to someone, look, you know, I do think your child you know, has got uh, you know, a small pneumonia there. We, we need to send them to hospital. It's going to need an X-ray. It's going to need IV antibiotics, et cetera. Um, but I think for most people, we don't, you know, if it's that bad, I'm happy to use the term. But if it's not that bad, I'm, I'm not going to alarm people unnecessarily. You've got a small infection. Let, let's get on and treat it. Mm. Uh, that makes um, me want to ask one more question then. Um, when you say X-ray the lungs, I had an X-ray, which they did for some health. They said, oh, you've got a lung infection. We wouldn't have known without the X-ray. So let us hit it with something strong to get rid of it before it becomes a problem. But how can you see an infection on an X-ray that I would imagine is only supposed to show bone? Yeah, yeah. No, you're right. Well, it, well, it, a normal lungs, uh, normal lungs are simply, you, you just see them as black on the X-rays. There's nothing there. But if they get an infection, they get what we say consolidated. They, they solidify and then become, you get white shadowing on the X-ray. So suddenly, yes, you're you're seeing something abnormal that would not normally be there. Um, so that's what uh, that's what the radiologists, the X-ray doctors, are looking for is shadowing on the lungs. Uh, if it's a really bad infection, it might be spread throughout the whole of both sides. But more commonly, it's just a small patch in one part of the lungs. Oh, look, that's where the infection is. Hit you with antibiotics. Perhaps repeat the X-ray after six weeks, or when you when you come to see us as, as, as GPs, we'll have a listen and say, "Oh, look, all those crackles that we'd heard previously." because uh, the shadowing is re reflected in crackles that we hear. Oh, those, those crackles have gone. You know, you're already telling me you're feeling better. Looks like the antibiotics have done their job. Yeah, okay, fine. I, I just remember I had an X-ray and thought, how did you know from an X-ray that I got, it just it threw me completely. Uh, <laughs> that's, that's our game. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's a medic doing their job, really, isn't it? That's, that's uh, you know, that's the training, I guess. Yeah. 
Okay, uh, let me just, I'll finish with this one then, because this, this one shocked me, and I'm still not sure it's true. I was in hospital one time, I had a really, that my muscle had lucked in my back or something, this is going back nearly a decade, and um, the doctors in the hospital were great, but they couldn't unlock it, they tried all sorts of things, and at some point he gave me this little cup, this very happy doctor, uh, one of the one of the consultants in the A&E, he said, just, just drink this Mr Berry, okay, so I drank it, he said, hope that will make you feel better, and I said, well what was that? Are you sure you want to know? Well, yeah, I'd like to know. Yeah, that was cocaine, which threw me because it was this sort of gopic looking fluid thing. Um, did I miss here? Um, well, uh, was it codeine or cocaine? I, I, th- I yeah, thought it was more likely to be. I don't know what it was. Codeine. It was a fluid. I doubt he'd have given you cocaine or he might have been struck off. <laughs> I, it just threw me. I thought, I'm <laughs> sure that's describe. not right. <laughs> We don't prescribe cocaine. No, it's, it's probably codeine, which is okay. a, a paracetamol. Um, often we give a small dose of diazepam uh, for where, where muscles go into spasm because it, in addition to be good for our heads, it also just unlocks muscle spasm, say, in the back. Um, so we want, if someone comes in with bad back pain, a lot of spasm, they pull their the ligaments holding their spine together and then the muscles go into protective spasm over the top. Um, the spasm can hurt more than the original condition, so we give a bit of, uh, in addition to general painkillers, we give uh, some low-dose diazepam, say two milligrams three times a day, just for a few days to unlock the spasm. So I guess it was probably codeine, not cocaine. <laughs> I, I always assumed I missed it. I hope so. <laughs> but I was on some all sorts of drugs, and they weren't working, and they was getting stronger and stronger, so careful because if this this goes out you'll have all sorts of people going to the a and e for cocaine yeah free <laughs> yes no it wasn't that i remember it was, a, it was a horrible looking liquid that didn't taste nice and he was smiling as he gave it to me but it seemed to work within half an hour I was actually able jolly, to move big, jolly good yeah eight <laughs> hours of all these different things uh plenty and plenty of gas and air enter knocks that wasn't working so yeah mm-hmm. hey it's fun i mean we're grateful for our, our doctors in the in, in nurses in the uk because you know what every time i've had to in, in be um, in a hospital situation, particularly whether it's children, myself, my wife, it's just however overworked they are. All I've ever met are the most compassionate, hardworking people. They're great. Oh, that's that's, that's good to hear. Isn't it? You know, it's very nice because obviously there's lots of complaints about the NHS. And you know, I saw somebody yesterday. Oh, I can never never get to see a doctor. The usual thing. And certainly, there's you know there there, there are problems, but it is very nice when we when we have. Uh, well, we have plaudits, as we call them, rather than complaints. <laughs> That's well, nice. I, I like to feedback encouragement as well as, you know, when it's, something's gone wrong, I like to point it out and also be encouraging because we all like a bit of an encouragement, don't we? Well, well and as Christians, you know, being being encouragers, being a Barnabas is, is important because this, as we all know, gosh, there's so much misery on the news around. Uh, and actually, there's all sorts of good things going on in the world which we don't hear about. So, yeah, encouraging. I think being encouraging is, is, uh, is a good Christian value. Mm. Absolutely. Great place to stop. Encourage your local doctors, nurses and pharmacists and say thank you. Be polite. Wait. Be patient and show them a little bit of joy, especially this time of year. Um, Thank you, Richard, as ever. We'll be back next week for more. Uh, We will touch in the future. We'll look at uh, cold plunges, the health values or not of those. Um, And yeah, if you've got any one quick fire questions, we'll do those every so often. But otherwise, we'll do topics. If you've got a particular topic, let us know. Hello at pure247radio.org. Hello at pure247radio.org. And we'll ask the doctor. Thank you, Dr. Scott. Always a pleasure. Take care. Bye for now. Pure 24-7 Radio is listener supported, which means we are free, online and always pure because of the generous support of our listeners. If you would like to contribute financially, please visit pure247radio.org. If you'd like to find out how we use your money, please visit the Our Cost section. Any donation of any size will help keep us on air and broadcasting for free. Thank you.